And I want to invite you to bow your heads with me as we ask the Holy Spirit to guide us this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we come before your presence and we recognize that we need to develop faith and learn how to use it, how to exercise it. And Father, we pray that you bless our study this morning, that you guide us through the scriptures. And I pray, Lord, that you translate this message for each person under the sound of my voice. Help everyone to understand for their own how to grow in faith. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want to start with a very basic question on this topic, and that is, what is faith? Okay, so we're going to try to answer that from the Bible. I know some of you may be thinking of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. We're going to go there. But the Bible illustrates a lot what faith is like. And by illustrating, help us to understand uh, what faith is. But we don't find necessarily a definition of faith in the Bible. But through our study this morning, we're going to understand what faith is. And I have a book here in my hand. It's called In the Spirit and Power. And uh, this is definitely a book that talks about faith and how to grow in faith. And let me tell you about uh, how I got this book for you because I have a, a box in the hallway uh, for you to take one if you make a commitment to read the book because we probably don't have one for every single person here in this sanctuary, but we, I think we certainly have for those that feel impressed to commit in reading this book. But I was in the conference office in Lansing, in the Michigan conference um, office there, and uh, they were the ones that gave me this book for the first time. And I read the book and I said, this book is so powerful. I even made a one or two sermons based on this book. And uh, some of you already bought the book and read and gave me awesome feedback on the book. But I asked the conference, can I have some of these books uh, for free so I can give, you know, the members of the Warren Church? And uh, the minister or director said, uh, you know, like I got these books actually for free and they were uh, for the pastors of the Michigan Conference. And uh, so I cannot really give it to you until everyone has the chance to get a copy for themselves if they want one. I said, okay, if you have leftover, can I take the book? And then he said, okay, I'll, take, I'll give you the book. So... Um, after a few months, I came back to him. I said, do you still have uh, some leftovers of those books? And so he thought I had forgotten, but I didn't. <laughs> so, and he said, yes, I do. I said, you told me you're going to give me some if you had uh, leftovers. Yes, but uh, that was a donation we don't sell yet. You told me that too. So that means you're going to give me for free. And... Um, <laughs> And uh, so, okay, so can I give you 30? I think it's 30. I said, okay, so I didn't want to press too hard. So, okay, I'll take 30. And uh, I have those books for you, but uh, please don't take it just for taking, okay? So they are available for you. I fought for this book, so you can have it. Uh, but I want to make sure you make use of the book. And another way of making good use of the book is uh, once you finish uh, reading, why not give it to someone for free? Because you receive it for free, right? For free, you give it. Uh, so do that. When you finish reading, you can give as a gift uh, to a person. It's a very, very powerful book which talks about the answers to prayer. It's written by Pastor Pavel Goya. So he has some amazing testimonies. So this is part of the sermon to make sure you... Um, acquire additional material on the topic of faith. You will definitely grow in faith as you read uh, this book. Okay, so, but let's try to answer this question. And I want to start in Matthew chapter 8. If you would please turn your Bibles there with me. 
So we are going to the Gospel of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. In chapter 8, we are going to read verses 7 and 8. But we find a story there when a centurion, who was a centurion? Do you remember that terminology from the Bible? It was, it was a captain over a hundred soldiers in the Roman Empire, right? So a centurion came to Jesus, and the Bible tells the reason he came to Jesus. That was he had one of his servants sick, and he had heard about Jesus. He believed in Jesus. He understood that Jesus had authority. Jesus had a what, everyone? authority and he went for Jesus to heal his servant and then the story goes on to say that Jesus said okay I'll come to heal your servant right and uh, that was the plan of Jesus to come to the house of this man or where this servant was laying sick but the message was please don't come to my roof don't come to heal my servant in person. So he didn't want to take the time of Jesus. He knew that Jesus was a busy man. And he said, listen, I am a man of authority. And when I say something, my servants, they follow my word. And he understood that Jesus was a man of authority as well. And he said, you speak the word only and my servant will be healed. Let's read that from the Bible. Let's begin in verse 7. The Bible says here, And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Notice the words now, but what's the next word there? Only speak a word and my servant will be what, everyone? Healed. So that's pretty amazing because Jesus actually commands, if you read the next verses, we are not going to read it here this morning, but you can read it from your Bible. Jesus actually commands his faith and says, I have never seen a face such as this, not even in Israel. Why did he say that? Because Israel was God's visible church on earth. And this man was a Roman, a centurion. He was not part of the church, but this man had a faith that he did not see even among his disciples, even among the children of Israel. And the faith that Jesus was so impressed was that this man understood who Jesus was, the authority that he had, and he trusted in the power of Jesus. And he understood that if Jesus spoke a word, only his servants would be healed. He understood the power of the words of Jesus. We're going to unpack that a little more as we go on this morning. But I want to impress that in your mind. Speak the word what? Only. Okay. Only speak a word and my servant will be healed. So he understood who Jesus was. Now let's go to the famous verse about faith in Hebrews chapter 11. So let's go there to Hebrews chapter 11. It's a Bible study on faith. We're going to go through several verses here. This is part of our series, by the way, on salvation. I keep coming back to this series. I want to make sure I cover as many topics as possible on the subject of salvation. Because I believe... We are here to get ready for the second coming of Jesus. Would you say amen? amen? We are here to be prepared for eternity. And the subject of faith is one of the subjects that we need to master if we want to live a life that God would like us to live. So Hebrews 11 verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things, what? Hope for the substance meaning, you know, it, it is like uh, the, what's the word? It, it is, it is the, I'm missing the word now. It's becoming tangible. What I have hoped for, what I haven't received yet, for me, it is a reality. There is substance. It is tangible. It says the evidence of things not what, everyone? Seen. Seen. Even though we don't see it, yet we know it exists. Even though we have not received it, we know that there is 
a reality that we are claiming for, okay? So we see here, and I want to show you another Bible verse quickly in the book of James. Just go one chapter, I mean one book over. In the book of James chapter 1, it's actually chapter 2, excuse me. And as we are turning there, let's meditate once again in this verse, Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now, faith is the substance, okay? So it, it is like something that you can, you know, grasp on. You can, you know, it becomes materialized. I think that's the word that I wanted to use. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, okay? So we claim God's promises, we hope for it, and even though we have not received yet, we can still have the assurance that it is real. The evidence of things not seen. Notice in James 1, 2, verse 17 and 18, it says, Thus also faith by itself, it does not have, if does not have what? Works, it is what? That. So this is helping us to understand what faith is. It does not have works, and the kind of works that it's talking about is works toward our fellow man, works toward God. It's talking about obedience. It's talking about the fruit of a life transformed by God's power. If faith in itself has no works, that faith is what, everyone? It is dead. In other words, it doesn't exist. And then it goes on to say, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. And I will show you my faith by what, everyone? By my works. This is very important, friends. Because does the devil believe that God exists? Yes or no? For sure. The Bible says, it's still here in the book of James in the same chapter, that the devil, he believes and he trembles. Now, let me ask you a question. Does the devil have faith in God? No. You see, friends, believing an intellectual assent to something is not faith. Faith is when we not only trust in God like that centurion man, we recognize his power and we trust in his word, but faith is also a desire to yield our will to God's will. That's why it says, you know, somebody says, I have faith, but I'm not willing to surrender. I'm not willing to follow through. I'm not willing to obey. Then that faith does not exist, it's dead. Oh, but I believe in the person of Jesus. So what? The devil believes also. Now, I want to go to another Bible story that helps us to understand what faith is. Let's go to Daniel chapter 3, okay? So we are going to the Old Testament now, the book of Daniel. In chapter 3, it tells the story of Daniel's three friends that they were requested to appear or to attend, I should say, to attend a meeting that the king of Nazar had set up to worship the golden image, okay? So he built a golden image, a representation of his power, his empire, and at the sound of the music, everybody needed to bow down and worship that image, okay? However, these three Hebrew men they were the followers of the true God. And they understood that they believed in the true God. They believed in the scriptures. They knew who the true God was. And they understood that they were not supposed to bow before a graven image and worship. That was their understanding. Okay, so they believed in that. But they not only believed that, they had faith in that. They had a what, everyone? Faith. faith. So much so that... Their attitude when the music played showed their works, which was basically to stand instead of bowing. It showed that their faith had works. Notice in verse 17, 18, because they eventually were taken 
to King Nebuchadnezzar because they didn't bow. And notice the conversation when Nebuchadnezzar was like trying to give them a chance. It says here, if that is the case, because they were not willing to take that chance, he says, if you don't bow, you're going to go to the fiery furnace. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is what, everyone? Able to deliver us. Did they trust in the power of God, yes or no? Yes. yes, just like that centurion man, even though they could not see it at that moment, okay, so all the circumstances around them was unfavorable. They could not see it, yet there was substance for them. There was a reality that for them was real. Okay, so it says here, the God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But, notice the kind of faith that they had. But what? If not. So they understood that their temporal life. What do I mean by temporal life? Meaning, their life on this earth was not everything. There was a life to come. Eternity was ahead of them. So they understood that about the God they served. It wasn't a blind faith that God needed to do everything they wanted, the way they wanted. But they understood that God was powerful to deliver. But they understood that he's going to answer based on what is best for them and for the situation. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve what? Your gods. Nor will worship the golden image which you have set up. Is there works here? Yes or no? Oh, yes. The works of standing, the works of coming before the king, the works of telling the king that they are going to remain obedient to God. Believing God does not lead to obedience. Or at least not any kind of belief. Faith in God leads to obedience. You understand that? That's the difference. I believe all of us here, we believe in God. But not necessarily all of us have faith in God. Faith is knowing who He is, recognizing His power, and being willing to surrender the will to him. That's faith. Now let's go on here. I want to read a statement from Martin Luther. Not Martin Luther King, but the, the reformer, the Protestant reformer. I want you to see what he wrote concerning faith. Notice carefully here with me. Faith is what? It's a living, bold Trust in God's grace, so certain of God's favor that it would risk death a thousand times trusting in it. Such a confidence and knowledge of God's grace. Notice that faith includes confidence and knowledge of God's grace. Makes you happy, joyful, and what else? Bold in your relationship to God and all creatures. Are you bold in your relationship to God and mankind? You see? Bold like those three Hebrew men that stood even though there was a death decree against them. Bold like Martin Luther that had to stand in a trial knowing that most likely the outcome was condemnation and death. He was willing to stand for his faith. Now, here's the question for us. Where does faith come from? Let's go back to the Bible and uh, read uh, from the Bible. In Romans chapter 10, verse 7. Let's go there. 17, excuse me. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. And let's understand where faith comes come from. Okay. 
And I want us to see beneath the surface of what the verse is telling us, although the whole verse is rich in information about faith, it says in verse 17, so then faith, what's the next word? Comes. So that's the answer for our question. Where does faith come from? Faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? And hearing by the what? The Word of God. The surface says we hear God's Word and we think of the Bible primarily, okay? And that's where faith comes from, right? Nevertheless, we need to go one step further. And that is why does the Word originate faith within us? The simple answer is, God is known through His Word. Faith comes from knowing who God is. You understand that? You know, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You understand that? My mouth will reflect or speak about who I am, will reveal who I am. The Word of God, okay, is a revelation of who He is. And that's why when we learn who God is, we develop faith. You see the experience of the three Hebrew men? He said, the God whom we serve Did they know God? Yes or no? For sure. You see, Martin Luther, faith is confidence and also a knowledge of God's grace, of who He is. Getting to know who God is in His Word, I don't want us to also live the surface. Let's study God's Word. But for what purpose? For knowledge, only intellectual understanding of the scriptures or for an experience with the creator it is to know who he is as a personal god we study the bible not only to give the right answers we study the bible to know who he is notice in the book testimonies for the church volume 1 page 620 says feeling is not what everyone faith Sometimes we feel like my faith is really high because we may be emotionally aroused, you know, maybe by a good sermon or maybe by the music or maybe by, you know, something that happened. But listen, we need to pass that. Feeling is not faith. Faith is simply to take God at His what? His word. Why do we take God at His word? Because we know who He is. We have learned to trust Him and to love Him. And in fact, we not only develop faith by getting to know God in the Bible, but also by creation. Why? How did God create all things? Through His Word. It's a revelation of who He is. In Romans 1.20 it says, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly what, everyone? Seen. How? Be understood by the things that are what, everyone? That are made. That's how you can get to know the Creator. His power. His love. For instance, when you look in nature, how, you know, A spring of water, very little, gives some water that feeds, you know, the brooks and uh, brings life to the vegetation and it feeds the big rivers and it goes to the oceans, always given, always given. And then the ocean, you know, it evaporates, the clouds take the water and water the earth and it produces fruit and the fruit gives and it yields seed which goes to the ground and grow more trees. It's a whole concept of serving, giving, producing life. 
Getting to know who God is generates faith and trust in Him. A desire to, to surrender the will to Him and obey Him. So here's a question. What is the role of faith in the salvation of men? Do you believe we are saved by faith? Do you believe that? You want to raise your hand if you believe that? Okay. So for those that didn't raise your hand, how are we saved? Okay, by grace. That's the other option. Notice, go there with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2 and get the answer straight from the Bible. But let's understand the role of faith in the salvation of man. In Ephesians 2, it tells us how we are saved and how we experience salvation. It reads, for by grace you have been what, everyone? Saved. saved. How are we saved so far here? By grace. And then you ask, what is God's grace? Everything that God does and, do, you know, does and will do to save you. His death on the cross, sending the Holy Spirit, His forgiveness, His power, His love, His intercession for us. It's all God's grace. By grace you have been saved. But how do we experience that grace, that salvation? Through faith. You understand? Faith is not salvation. Faith is the means for you to reach God's grace. It's like the hand. Think about that. You know, we say that grace is God's unmerited gift of salvation for mankind. I need a volunteer. Usually, you know, Paul likes to volunteer. Is that okay? Would you volunteer? Can you hold this Bible for me? Yes. Okay. So let's say that Paul wants to give me a gift. Okay. This is a good gift. It is. Yes. And by the way, it was Robert that gave me that Bible. I really like it, okay? So treat it really well. And uh, he wants me to give me a gift, and I have not done anything to deserve it. I never did anything for him, let's say. And then he says, I have a gift for you. And offer to me. I have a gift for you. This is a book that I think you should really read. Thank you. Pay attention and listen to the words. Okay, so hand it to me. Hand it to you. Just hand it, yes. Okay. So the gift is here, but what is the problem? I'm not taking it. Let's do it here like so more people can see and people in the camera at home too. So, so give it to me. <laughs> see? So what do I have to do in order to accept the gift? You have to take it. I have to take it. So this is God's grace, the gift of salvation, but this is faith, the hand that takes hold and receives the gift. Now that is a precious gift I want you to know. So Thank you. Enjoy it. Thank you. I will. I'm already You're enjoying. Welcome. Make no mistake. So let's go back here. Again, the verse says, by grace you have been what, everyone? Saved, and then it says, through faith, that's the hand that takes hold of God's promises, of God's gifts. And that's not of yourself, it is a gift of God. Now, I want to read a statement from the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, on page 431, that talks about what we are discussing here. While the sinner cannot save himself, is that a true statement, yes or no? Oh, yes. While the sinner cannot save himself, he still has something to do to secure salvation. It's kind of almost a contradiction. He cannot save himself, but he needs to do something to save himself. So what, what would that be? Notice. Faith is the gift of God, but the power to what? Exercise it or use it is ours. Faith is what, everyone? The hand. Faith is what? Hand. The hand by which the soul takes hold upon the divine offers of grace and mercy. So we're not saved by faith. Faith is the means 
to secure God's grace and salvation. But we need to exercise. We're going to talk about this this morning, if time allows. I already see that uh, we are moving fast here. But that's why in Hebrews 4.16, the Apostle Paul says, Let us therefore, what's the next two words? Come boldly. That's the need for us to use faith. Okay, come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain, you know, the hand that grabs, obtain mercy, that's God's grace, and find grace to help in time of need. Now, what's the experience of someone who has faith or trust in the Word of God? Let's see the experience. But before we see that, let's understand something about God's Word. Let's understand something about what, everyone? God's Word. As we already mentioned, God's Word has creative power. In Psalms 33, verse 6 and 9 says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke, and what happened? And it was done. He commanded and stood fast. Number one, God's word has creative power. God's word has what kind of power? Creative power. When we trust in God's word by faith, Yield our will to God's word. That's what we experience. What's the first word? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew our steadfast spirit within me. We experience the creative power of God and become a new creature. As far as the knowledge we have of God, understanding of who he is and his word, we become a new creature. Another factor about God's word is in Hebrews 1.3, who, talking about Jesus, being the brightness of his glory, the glory of the Father, and the express image of his person, and notice what Jesus does with his words. And what's the next word? Upholding all things by the word of his power. So the word of Jesus can not only create but uphold. Do you want to experience the creative power and the upholding power of God to sustain you? As we are going through difficult times, challenges, temptation, we can experience if we make a decision to get to know who God is and surrender the will in obedience to his word. He will sustain us through his power, through his word. Now, here's the experience. I will go quickly here for the sake of time. But notice the experience also of someone who has faith in God. Romans 5.1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, meaning forgiven by faith, we have what kind of experience? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By faith, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and I take hold of that grace and claim it for myself. And I experience forgiveness, acceptance, peace. So what is the evidence of genuine faith? Let's continue to talk about this. The experience or the evidence. What, how does it look like the life of someone who exercises faith? Notice carefully with me. Romans 3.31. Do we then make void the law through faith? What's the answer for that question? Certainly not. On the contrary, what's the experience of someone who lived by faith? We establish the law, obedience to God. I want to read this statement from Faith and Works, page 52. The faith in Christ that saves the soul is not what is, it is represented to be by many. Notice. Believe, believe. Is their cry. Only believe in Christ and you will be saved. It is all you have to do. Like an intellectual ascent of the existence of Jesus. Okay. That's what some people claim. While true faith trusts wholly in Christ for salvation. It will lead to perfect conformity to what everyone? To the love of God. That's what Paul said. By faith we establish the law. Obedience to God, like the three Hebrew men standing before 
the statue of Nebuchadnezzar, perfect obedience to God's will. It goes on to say faith is manifested by what, everyone? By works. We read that in James chapter 2. And the apostle John declares, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandment, is a what, everyone? It's a liar, and the truth is not in him. 1 John 2, 4. In fact, when we go to the book of Hebrews, I want you to go there with me. Hebrews chapter 11, that's the New Testament scriptures. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. There in this chapter, you find the gallery of those men of faith, men and women of faith. And it describes their lives and how they demonstrated that they trusted God, that they had faith in God. And all of them had works to show. Had a clear response to the knowledge of the will of God. Yielding obedience to what they knew was right. Let's begin in Hebrews 11 verse 4, talking about Abel. It says, by faith Abel, what did he do? Offer to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, right? Through which he obtained witness that he was what kind of man? Righteous. So God requested something of him, and his faith was not only an intellectual assent to that, but yielding his will to conformity to the will of God. Hebrews 11 verse 7, talking about Noah, says, By faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, talking about rain and a flood, moved with godly fear. So that's the action. He moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heirs of the righteousness which is according to faith. There you have he understood who God was, what God was going to do, what God's will was for him, and he acted upon it. Trusting in the power of God, trusting in the wisdom of God, trusting in the will of God. So notice in verse 8, same chapter, talking about Abraham, it says, By faith, Abraham, what's the next word, everyone? Yeah. Obeyed. When he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Perfect submission to the will of God. How do we exercise faith, friends? I want to share with you. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 3, okay? And I want to share with you a couple Bible verses that gives you an indication how you can exercise faith. Okay, so we're going to Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. Notice carefully. What's the first word of that verse, everyone? Trust. trust. What's another word of, for trust in the Bible? Faith. That's right. Trust in the Lord with how much of your heart? All, All your heart. How do you do that? And lean not on your own, what everyone? Understanding. Understanding. In other words, if you want to live the life of faith, let me give you a basic example, okay? Just a basic example. So if you want to live a life of faith, God gives His commandments. He gives like the Sabbath as part of His commandments. You learn about it. And you want to live a life of faith, you trust Him. Even though you may not understand or in your mind it is okay to work on Sabbath, to make more profit or whatever else, you trust in God and you yield your will to Him and you do not lean on your own understanding, rationalizing. When we begin to rationalize God's Word, we are not living the life of faith. But when we submit to God's Word, that's the life of faith. Rationalizing God's Word is presumption which is using God's word to excuse sin and disobedience. Faith, trusting God, is when we take God at his word and we trust him even though we may not have all the answers. I want to read this statement to you, friends. True faith and true prayer, how strong they are. They are as two arms 
by which the human suppli uh, suppliant lays hold upon the power of infinite love. Faith is what, everyone? Trusting in God. Believing that he loves us. And knows that, uh, excuse me, and knows what is for our best good. Does God know what is best for us? Sometimes we may not understand. And we are led to question, God, where are you? Because our frustrations, you know, our expectations has been frustrated. But God knows what is best. Thus, instead of our own way, it leads us to choose whose ways? His way. So we're not leaning upon our own understanding to do whatever we want. Finding excuses not to obey. No, the life of faith will lead us to choose His way in place of our, what? Ignorance. It accepts His wisdom. In place of our weakness, His strength. In place of our sinfulness, His what? Righteousness. Friends, I have seen people not trusting that God can forgive their sins. They really think that their sins are so big that God cannot forgive. Yet the Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. Do you believe in God's word or do you, are you going to lean upon your own understanding? You go with God's word. Let me give you another Bible verse that helps you to understand how to exercise faith. Go to Galatians chapter 2. And now the Apostle Paul is going to talk about it. About how to live a life of faith. Galatians chapter 2. We're going to read verse 20. The Bible says here. Excuse me. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I have been what everyone? crucified with Christ. Is that a literal language or, or a metaphor? It's a metaphor, right? So what does that mean then? Let's continue reading. It is no longer I who what? Live. In other words, Paul is not living his life based on his own inclination. He is choosing to deny himself, to die to self, to allow Christ to live in him. But Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, meaning here in this body, I live by what, everyone? Faith. By faith in the Son of God. Therefore, living by faith is when I choose not to live and allow Christ to live in me. Amen. So in other words, if I feel tempted to do something that I know God's Word says for me not to do, but I feel that inclination of doing it when I choose to dive to that inclination so Christ can live in me and I surrender my will to him, that is the life of faith. I say, Lord, help me with this temptation. I may quote Bible promises, promises. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, he will receive the crown of life that he has given for them that love him. And I quote it. And I claim the promise, surrender will, and that's the life of faith. Now, don't miss this part, the latter part of this verse. I don't want you to miss. What is the motivation to deny yourself and to die to your own inclination, the sinful inclinations, of course? What's the motivation? Notice, he tells you. Let's read the whole verse again so you can get the whole feel here. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. What's the motivation? Who loved me and gave himself for me. Getting to know who he is personally will give you the motivation to deny self and yield your will to His will. And that's the life of faith. 
Now, another Bible verse, Luke chapter 9, 23. This is Jesus speaking. It says, then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, be a follower of Jesus, live the life of faith, let him do what? Deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Do you see? A life of denying the sinful pleasures of the, fa- of the flesh, excuse me, is to live the life of faith as well. And the, if the motivation is not the love of God, it's not knowing who He is, not having a personal experience with Him, then it becomes legalism. I deny myself, I suppress my flesh, okay? but it is dry. It's a formality. No one wants to be around me if there is no love. Okay, so, but when our motivation is empowered by God's, a knowledge of God's love, then that's the life of faith. I want to read this statement to you. Listen very carefully in the book, Steps to Christ. I like to show in the Bible first before I go to any other reference. Okay, Steps to Christ, page 48, it says, Through the right exercise of what, everyone? Of the will. An entire change may be made in your life by, what's next word now? Yielding up your will to Christ, you ally yourself with the power that is above all principalities and power. You will have strength from above to hold you steadfast. Remember the characteristic of God's word, not only to give you a new heart, but to uphold you. And thus... Through what kind of surrender? How often? Constant surrender to God. You will be enabled to live the new life, even the life of what? Of faith. Yes. Believing God is one thing. The devil believes and trembles. Have faith in God is constant surrender your will to the will of God. And again, the motivation, Paul says... For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through what? Through love. That's our motivation. Now, I want to close our message this morning with at least, let me share two examples in the Bible of people living and exercising faith. The first one is... Peter, as we heard in the story, I'm not going to give you all the details of the story, but I want you to see his experience because at first he succeeded. At first he what, everyone? He succeeded, but then he sunk. And that is our experience too because we are learning to trust in who he is and his power. So we go through that same experience as well of trusting, doubting, trusting, Feeling fear. So let's read what happened here. Let me pick up the story in verse 29. It says, so he said to Peter when he asked him, I, you know, command for me to come. So he understood that God needed to command him. And then Jesus says what? Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he did what, everyone? He walked on water. To go to Jesus. He trusted in the word of Jesus. Because he knew who Jesus was. He was reliable. He could trust his word. But then something happens around him. I want you to see this. It goes on to say. But when he. What's the next word? He saw that the winds was boisterous. In other words. He began to look to the situation around him. Instead of focusing God's word and his character. So he saw that the wind was boisterous. He was, a, he was what, everyone? He was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you, what's the next word? Doubt. You see that experience? We doubt when we look to the circumstances around us. Instead of focusing in God and His Word. 
I'm going to skip this for now and let me go to the experience of Abraham. Now, Abraham, did he believe in God that he was going to have a child? Yes or no? Yeah, yes and no, because he tried to help God. He said, okay, so he accepted Sarah's proposal for him to have another wife in order to have a child. And that was a clear doubt on God's power and who he was. So God needed to rebuke and work with him because of that. Now, let's read the story now when he actually trusted in God. It says in verse 18, Who contrary to hope, why contrary? Because he was old, his wife was old. In hope, he did what? Believed. So that he became the father of many nations according to what was, what, what's the next word? So trust in God's word for knowing who he is. So shall your descendants be, and not being, how? In faith. Weak in faith, he did not consider his own body. He didn't look to the circumstances around him of, of, or his own strength. Not considering his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Not even that he considered, but he focused on God's word. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthening faith, giving glory to God, and being, what's the next two words? Fully convinced in what? That what he had promised, he was also able to, to perform it. And that's the kind of faith we need to have, friends.